Hello and welcome everybody to uh, the last keynote talk of our triple conference. Um, this keynote uh, or rather capstone talk will be given by Hans Christian Hege from SUSE Institute Berlin. He's the head of the visual data analysis group there. And uh, he's of course a very well-known person in our field. So I almost feel like there's no need to introduce him at all, but uh, of course I will do this uh, shortly. Um, so, um, as you might remember from Dimo Ropinski's talk uh, in the first uh, session on the first day, uh, Hans Christian Eden is actually one of the fathers of VCBM, so to say. So, he was the, the person suggesting this meeting to Bernhard Prime and um, has ever shown a great commitment to, to VCBM. But he's also a, a very committed person to the whole visualization community, I would say. So he uh, is also an elected fellow of Eurographics since 2016. And um, yeah, um, he started his career, uh, so to say, studying physics and mathematics at uh, Freie Universität Berlin, uh, where he also worked uh, for researcher for some time. Uh, then he joined the SUSE Institute, um, where he uh, soon became head of back then the Department of Scientific Visualization, which is now called the Visual and Data-Centric Computing, Computing Group. Uh, he's a very uh, prolific researcher. So Google Scholar lists more than 400 uh, publications and over 10,000 uh, citations. And um, I'm sure this is uh, still an underestimation of, of his work uh, as usual on, on Google Scholar. Um, but he's not only a very active uh, scientist, but he's also uh, a co-founder of uh, quite a few companies, successful companies, I want to say. Uh, he has had uh, the guest professorship at uh, Barcelona, honorary professorship at the uh, German Film School, to, to name just a few other stations in his life. And um, yeah, as I said, he, he has been committed to, to VCBM right from the beginning, uh, helping to, to bring this event into life. And uh, his research interest also naturally uh, includes uh, life sciences. And um, therefore, uh, his talk, uh, as you can see today, will also um, cover this topic, a very timely topic at these times. And uh, it's uh, entitled Human Against Virus, New Needs for Visual Computing and Visual Communication. So without further ado, um, I'm very happy that you're here, uh, Christian, today and uh, will give this talk to us and um, our virtual stage is yours now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here at uh, the 10th uh, VCBM. Uh, and first, of course, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me and uh, yeah, coming to the topic now in the recent months, I think we all have learned that uh, epidemics can uh, threaten humanity. And uh, at least uh, it applies to those who are not experts in infectious diseases, uh, virology or immunology or epidemiology. Um, and uh, we observe that currently almost every science is trying to contribute uh, to the solution of the many problems that arise in this uh, pandemic. So the question is, can our subject uh, and which I will now call visual computing also contribute uh, to cope with uh, this uh, threat? Uh, visual computing is an umbrella term and here I mean with visual computing, mainly data visualization, visual anal analytics, and also image processing and anatomy reconstruction. So if you look at uh, Google Scholar, you find uh, that 1,300,000 papers have already been published on uh, COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS virus. And uh, if you look for uh, papers uh, in which uh, the, wish, the term visual appears, you find uh, in every seventh paper, this is the case. If you look for vis visualization, you find it's in every 12th paper, the case. Uh, of course, these terms are very unspecific. Uh, in particular, visualization typically includes in biology also image acquisition. They call this often visualization. Um, 
uh, but nevertheless, it's, uh, these are many papers. Uh, image analysis shows up in 40,000 papers, computer graphics in 3,000, data visualization also in 3,000. So uh, this seems to be, our work seems to have some impact uh, on this uh, field. And uh, this is what I want to explore a little bit more in this uh, talk. First, I will talk about viruses in general uh, and specifically, of course, uh, about the coronavirus, about visualization in epidemiology. Then I wanted to talk also about visual computing in track and vaccine development and also about visual computing in diagnosis and therapy. But while preparing the talk, I realized this is just too much. I would need three or four hours to talk about all these topics. So I will focus mainly on visualization in epidemiology, or they, though I would like very much like to talk more about the molecular stuff, but uh, time is just not sufficient uh, to do that. So let us start with uh, viruses. So life on Earth uh, originated more than 4 billion years ago, and it can be traced back to a common root, the last universal common uh, ancestor called Luca. So highly developed life forms will disappear from Earth in a billion years. So it's only finite, we know that, and in one 0.6 billion years approximately, also bacteria will disappear. Um, so uh, there are three domains of life, uh, namely bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. Uh, we belong to the last group. So the uh, animals and humans belong to the last group. The world of viruses is separate. They do not really count as life because they have no metabolism and they cannot reproduce themselves. So viruses do not count as life. The replication of viruses therefore must be performed by host cells, uh, which, are, which come from all these three groups, bacteria, archaea, and uh, eukaryotes. So there are specific uh, types of viruses, which in fact, uh, for instance, bacteria, these are called phages or archaea or uh, uh, animals, plants and humans. So the uh, viruses are very diverse, really diverse. So it, uh, they are diverse with, with regards to the uh, types of the genomes. Uh, so there are RNA viruses like uh, the coronavirus, but also DNA viruses like uh, the herpes virus. The strandedness differs. So they are viruses which have just a single strand uh, in which uh, the genomic information is coded or they have a double strand. Uh, then the reading direction of the RNA viruses, uh, they are also, uh, they vary. So they are, they read in the positive direction or negative direction without explaining exactly what this means. And there are even viruses where the the genomic code is read in two directions, uh, creating different uh, uh, proteins then. So the structures uh, of the viruses and the replication strategies are really quite uh, diverse. And as I already said, they infect all types of life forms, eukaryotes and prokaryotes. So what are the shared features of viruses? So generally they are quite small. So diameter is smaller than 200 nanometers. Uh, there are a few exceptional cases, but uh, for the majority, this is true. They contain no ribosomes, which is a necessary component of cells uh, um, for the protein making translational machinery. And uh, they can replicate only within a host cell. So this means we can define a virus as a submicroscopic infectious agent that replicates only inside the living cells of an organism. And here on the right side, you see an electron microscopy image, a scanning electron microscopy image showing uh, the SARS uh, virus, uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus uh, on an infected cell. So the magenta uh, colored uh, particles are uh, virus or virions uh, as uh, experts call it, call it, the single particles often called virions. 
So here's an electron microscopy image of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, the coronavirus. Um, yeah, the size varies. It's, uh, it's, it's a bit surprising, but uh, I also have no closer, more information about that uh, seems to be the case. Uh, the prominent spikes, which uh, gave them the names, are yeah, nine to 10, uh, Nano, 9 to 12 nanometers long. Uh, the virus is a positive sense single stranded RNA virus, and it uh, has just one single linear RNA segment. So the uh, RNA sequence uh, is uh, 30,000 kilo uh, 30 uh, kilobases in length, which means it's the largest known genome of all RNA viruses. Uh, the RNA codes for non-structural proteins, uh, which are responsible for the replication of the RNA itself, and uh, for four different structural proteins. Um, three of them are, are used to embed, uh, uh, are in the viral membrane that envelops uh, the nuclear capsid in which uh, the uh, RNA is uh, located. So the fourth protein and the RNA together form the nucleocapsid, so the inner part of the virus. Here you see a schematic representation of the structure of the virus. Um, this is just, uh, it's really schematic. Uh, so the, uh, the spike proteins, which are shown here, they are uh, much too large. They should be smaller in, in comparison comparison to the rest, but it's, yeah, as I said, it's a, a schematic. So you see here the, the spike uh, glycoproteins, um, then inside the RNA, and the rest are the other proteins, which I mentioned, which build uh, the membrane and uh, which also um, yeah, help uh, to, to, uh, to, to replicate the virus and to uh, enter the, uh, the host cell. And uh, what is mostly responsible for the entry in the host cell is this spike protein, which sits on top of the virus. Um, it shows up in various forms. And during the pandemic, uh, the, uh, the virus is still, uh, of course, um, mutating genetic genetically. So um, um, evolution is taking place and a more infectious vari variant of the spike protein has replaced uh, as a dominant form. So the virus has become a bit more infectious than it was uh, six months ago, unfortunately. So the uh, whole spike protein has been reconstructed at the atomic level using cryo uh, electron microscopy and uh, which is very nice and which is a great success, I think, to science that this was possible in such a short uh, amount of time uh, because it's really complex uh, to do that. So the spike protein performs two different tasks. It's, uh, it attaches to the host cell, it fuses uh, with its membrane. Uh, and uh, for this, there are two subunits available, subunit S1, which contains the receptor binding domain which binds to the host cell receptor. The receptor on the host cell is a certain enzyme which is located on typically uh, on many human cells. And uh, the second subunit uh, is used to fuse uh, of the, the, with the virus, the virus envelope with a cell membrane such that it can uh, enter the, uh, the host cell. And uh, the cell entry is also supported by uh, some certain uh, agent, uh, cellular protease, uh, temper SS2, and also other uh, proteases. Because this is so important um, um, in the process, uh, this molecule, temper SS2, it's also a candidate for vaccine uh, development. Yes, and as I already mentioned, so the receptor to which the virus talks, uh, the ACA2, um, uh, enzyme. This uh, occurs on the cell of uh, human cell on the surface of human cells and uh, many different cells like uh, airway epithelia, enterocytes, vascular endothelial cells, renal epithelial, and myocardial cells. And uh, therefore, the 
the virus enters not just the lungs at uh, in the beginning was a thought, but uh, it affects all the intestines, uh, kidneys, the heart, the central nervous system. So here you see an image uh, of such a, uh, of many uh, such uh, virions. Uh, it's an, also again from scanning electron microscopy, you see a cell which is uh, infected uh, by many such uh, virus particles that, which are sitting on top of the cell. Uh, now about the entry and the replication of the virus in host cells. Uh, this is uh, also a really interesting uh, process which one needs to understand in order to develop, uh, for instance, vaccines or, or, or uh, agents for, for medical treatment. So in, in the first step, uh, the virus enters uh, the host cells by binding the spike uh, glycoprotein to the cellular receptor. This is uh, the, this uh, molecule shown here. And uh, it's, sorry for, for, for showing a German slide, but uh, it was the best uh, which I found. Um, and uh, this uh, Temper SS2 here helps to activate uh, that process. And uh, yeah, I do not try to, to explain in detail what, it, what it's really doing, but uh, after this, uh, the virion enters the host cell and then the viral RNA is released to the cytoplasm and it's translated to messenger RNA and the RNA is replicated by the RNA polymerase. And then the virions are assembled uh, in the endoplasmatic reticulum and uh, the Golgi apparatus and uh, subsequently they are released from the cells via vesicles by exocytosis. So this is uh, the whole process. It's rather well understood uh, um, because we had other viruses before where this has been studied, which behave very similar. So this is rather well uh, known. Now about epidemiology. Um, so what are the goals of epidemiology? Of course, they want to describe and analyze the spread of diseases. They want to analyze uh, the factors that influence uh, the health and the, uh, the, the illnesses. And they want to predict the spread of diseases and they want to develop countermeasures. I think these are the major goals. And uh, specific questions uh, that come up in a pandemic, of course, are what is the current state of the pandemic? How can we make progress against the pandemic and uh, are we making uh, progress at all. So um, with regards to the spread of the infectious uh, virus, uh, of course, you, you know what, what the basic uh, um, mechanism is, but to, to get you in, into the mood, uh, uh, I will, would like to show you a highly simplifying uh, movie. So it's uh, from the Washington Post has been published in March uh, this year. So let me start that movie. Doesn't start, ah, yeah, it starts. Okay, what we see here are, um, uh, in fact, people, persons. So each uh, bubble represents one person. And uh, in the beginning, they are healthy, only few are sick. Uh, I think in the beginning, there were just three sick. And we have a very, very simple model uh, where each of the sick persons, whenever it contacts a healthy person, it really infects the person. So of course, it is a great simplification. And uh, furthermore, uh, the, uh, um, the sick uh, uh, persons also uh, stay uh, sick uh, all the time, which is also not realistic. But it's a simplifying model. And uh, here we see now what happens. So they are moving around and uh, healthy persons uh, meet uh, sick persons and they become infected. And of course, very soon, uh, almost all uh, of them are infected. And then also people start to recover, become, uh, become healthy uh, again and uh, immune hopefully against the virus. And uh, on the top, you see the, the graph that results for these uh, three different groups. Um, and now the next, uh, think what we can simulate here is we try to uh, quarantine uh, 
some of these uh, persons, uh, but it's not perfect. And of course, if it's not perfect, so they get out uh, the, the sick uh, persons and also infect again uh, healthy persons. And of course, we get a different uh, course uh, in the top. Um, so it's, uh, in fact, it, it happens almost the same if uh, the quarantine is not, uh, 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 not perfect. And now here it's shown with the uh, social distancing. Of course, everything is uh, very uh, is slower. And uh, yeah, but this is uh, of course uh, obvious. So maybe, maybe I just stop uh, the movie here. Thank you. Uh, now, one important, real, really important uh, um, uh, yeah, quantity in epidemiology is uh, the reproduction number. The reproduction number, which just measures uh, is, uh, the, the number of cases that an infected person infects. Uh, one discriminates between the basic reproduction number and the effective reproduction number. Basic is uh, the case when all individuals in the population are still susceptible to the information and effective is what you have during uh, uh, the uh, epidemics. And uh, you can compute this uh, um, reproduction number. It's just a product of three factors. Uh, the first factor covers the number of contacts the infected person has per unit, uh, per time unit. Uh, the next uh, factor is the probability, probability of infection on contact. And uh, the last factor is the mean duration of infectivity. And the most the important thing is that the first two factors uh, depend on the human behavior. So we can change them. Only the last one is fixed. Just by reducing the number of contacts uh, and by reducing the probability uh, of infection by, for instance, wearing a mask. So this is the essential parameter. Uh, it also shows up in all epidemiological models, uh, this number. Uh, and uh, I think it's, uh, yeah, the effective reproductive number is by far the most important uh, parameter in an epidemic, which uh, really greatly facilitates uh, to understand uh, the whole process. Uh, just a short uh, side remark, um, even this number beside the number of the infected people in total was too much for German politicians. So one of the uh, famous politicians uh, in, said in, in TV that, uh, he does not like the second number. Uh, he was outraged about it, that he has to think about a second number. And uh, another uh, also famous politician also speculated that uh, or fantasized that this uh, value of the reproduction uh, number is manipulated uh, in order to prevent discussions about relaxations of measures against uh, the pandemic. So uh, this also already shows how difficult or what problem it is to communicate these facts uh, to politicians and to the general uh, audience. Okay, uh, in epidemiology, uh, people try to model the spread of diseases mathematically. So basically it's a stochastic process, but by working with uh, statistical expectation values, one can obtain uh, deterministic descriptions. And uh, mostly used are so-called compartment models. So which are systems of ordinary differential equations. The very simple, but too simple model is the SI model, which models the spread of infectious disease without uh, any recovery. The SES model, which uh, considers also the formation of immunity, but it's still uh, too simple to be realistic. The SIR model starts to become a little bit more realistic. Uh, it considers also uh, uh, the in immunity formation and the SEIR model this is what is mostly used and even much more advanced models are used uh, nowadays. Uh, I will talk about this a little bit later. Uh, one, these models don't consider space. They just consider time dependencies between, uh, yeah, part, between parts of the population. Uh, if you want to consider also um, the spatial distribution, uh, it becomes much more complex. And then uh, mathematically you would have to solve uh, the partial differential equations, which is much more uh, expensive uh, and more difficult uh, to model. Uh, 
but uh, people also are starting doing that. And uh, what is also very often used nowadays are agent-based models, so st stochastic models uh, in which individual people or persons are uh, modeled uh, and, and their behavior is modeled and then a lot of statistics is done to see what a whole population is, uh, is doing. So let me shortly explain uh, compartmental models because they are used so often and uh, we also will, will deal with them uh, later. So uh, these are, it's a very, very simple concept. So we, we consider the temporal change of a size, of the size of a group. Uh, so, and here we have four different groups. So susceptible ones, uh, those we, which are exposed uh, and uh, the infected ones and those which are, uh, which have recovered. Um, and then we, we model, uh, so the flows between these groups by very simple equations. So this uh, prime just means it's a, it's a time derivative. So the change of S is just the flow which flows from S to E. Uh, to, uh, and this is proportional uh, to I. And uh, you, you do this for all, all these four uh, uh, groups, then you get four differential equations, uh, which are very simple. Uh, they contain, of course, constants. So th this is uh, the R naught, so the uh, basic reproduction number and uh, the, uh, the time it needs to, uh, um, um, what is it, uh, the time, this uh, incubation period, and uh, the other T inf, this is uh, the average uh, time uh, that a patient is infectious. These are the, uh, the, the constants which are needed to uh, really simulate uh, uh, what is happening. Of course, without any mitigation measures and nothing. So it's just uh, the basic pure uh, ep epidemiolo uh, epidemics, uh, how it would occur uh, if you have no additional measures. If you have additional measures, these, um, um, these uh, parameters, for instance, uh, change. Yeah? And then we, get, uh, we can adapt our model. Okay, um, here is an example of such a simulation of an SIR model. So you have the, the four groups exposed, infectious, removed, so those which are not anymore uh, considered and uh, susceptible, susceptible ones. And you see uh, at the beginning, almost all were susceptible and uh, they become uh, much fewer ones. And uh, the uh, removed ones, uh, of course, increase uh, over time and uh, the exposed ones uh, are shown here and the infectious ones are shown here. So this is a typical result and uh, many programs are available to simulate that. You can download these and run it in Python, do your own experiments by just uh, plugging in parameters. It's really rather simple uh, to do nowadays. And uh, the next, uh, if you do that, then you will realize that it's difficult to really uh, uh, reproduce what uh, is uh, observed, you need a more complex model. And the first thing you can do is just uh, use different values of R0 zero or R0, it's also called, called and um, fit these uh, four unknown values to the data. You have a lot of data um, and then fit it to the data and then you are maybe are able to, uh, to extrapolate. And this has been done here and uh, the data have been used until that time and the rest uh, is fitted. So you see th this is possible, but still this extrapolation is, uh, is a bit uh, uh, dangerous, of course. But this is how in principle uh, this, uh, the experts uh, work. Now, just a few words about the exponential phase. So if you, uh, we have exponential growth, um, uh, at least in the beginning of uh, such uh, pandemics, and you can just write it uh, in this form where uh, this uh, tau is uh, the doubling time. So the time which is needed, which you can just empirically observe to, to double the number of infected people. And uh, if you now, uh, uh, apply this SEER model. Uh, mathematically, you find this relation between the doubling time and the infectious uh, time and uh, tau and uh, R naught. And if you plug this in into, into this equation, you, you get uh, this equation. And this shows uh, 
um, it's, it's a very simple law uh, which uh, the epidemics is following, at least in the beginning. And it also shows how important it is uh, that the reproduction number is uh, smaller than one. And uh, yeah, if, uh, if you are in mid of the pandemic, you don't use uh, this reproduction number and, and you have mitigation strategies, but you use a fitted uh, reproduction number, but nevertheless, uh, it should be smaller than one. Otherwise, you have uh, exponential growth. So what are the more advanced models? In the more advanced models, of course, uh, more groups are added. So you, you do it in a more realistic way by, by adding uh, more uh, subgroups in this case and uh, also additional uh, groups. So here is, uh, for instance, the group of the people who died. And uh, uh, this makes it more realistic. And uh, then you can add also stochastic components. So for instance, you can use a probability distribution for when a currently infected individual will transmit the virus and also a probability distribution for when an infected individual will succumb to the virus. And uh, this, uh, of course, then you need these probability distributions. Of course, again, you can try to get them from the data uh, in kind of inverse uh, problem uh, and then use it in the simulation. But uh, yeah, this is uh, what, what is uh, typically done in epidemiology. And the next step is our uh, agent-based models. Uh, I will talk about these uh, a little bit later. Uh, first, let me show just uh, um, now a few examples uh, for visualization in epidemiology. Um, and we have to discriminate between different yeah, end users, so to say. So we do visualization for the general public, for political consulting and for the researchers. Uh, and the, the needs of course are rather different. Uh, let me start with uh, the first group, general public. Uh, you find in almost all newspapers now and in, on the online sites of the uh, newspapers, uh, really nice uh, visualizations, uh, which, um, which show, which give an idea. So what is the state of the pandemic? So this shows the worldwide overview. It's from the New York Times and it's a, yeah, it's a JavaScript uh, web page. So you can hover with your, with your mouse over the countries and then you get additional information. Um, so this is, uh, I think, very useful and uh, everybody uh, can use it without uh, any uh, special knowledge. Uh, this is another uh, website, it's from the uh, World Health Organization. They, they needed quite some time until they really were able to, to visualize the data, but nowadays they have also a very nice uh, web page uh, showing um, such visualizations. So you can do it, of course, uh, more locally. So this is a German uh, paper, a newspaper. Um, where you see the different states in Germany with the different uh, infection cases. And again, you can, uh, can hover with the mouse and get uh, more information. Here, the information is shown about uh, tubing. Uh, yeah, so this has become uh, pretty standard uh, within the yeah, few last month. And it's, it's a great improvement compared to the situation before, at least in Germany, the German newspapers had almost no data visualizations available, but they learned a lot. They hired teams and they really developed nice, uh, nice web pages. Yeah, again, uh, other visualizations here. Uh, now a timeline, you see the infection cases over time. Uh, also the death cases over time, it's uh, for Germany in this case. Uh, stacked representations, of course, all kinds of representations that have been developed. Uh, plots, simple plots, still this is, and we will see this later, probably the most useful type of visualization for showing infection curves. It's quantitative, it shows everything you want uh, to see, and it, you can put many lines on, on a chart and uh, can com do comparisons. So it's uh, uh, still the best uh, you can do. Yeah. Intensive care beds, uh, yeah. how many beds are available? How many COVID patients are in intensive care? Uh, how many of them of uh, uh, how many of them are ventilated. All these things you can see now uh, on the web. It's uh, nicely visualized and uh, the data are available, fortunately. And uh, so this is really great. Um, animated maps, another possibility to visualize uh, the temporal development. 
I think for reasons of time, I don't uh, show the movies which I have here. No. Um, okay, just a few more examples, mitigation and restrictions. You, this is also nicely visualized now. You can just uh, hover again over countries and then you get information uh, about, uh, about this. This brings me to a different topic, uh, uncertainty. So the reproduction number over time, uh, which is uh, difficult to compute uh, from data. And of course you have uncertainties in it if you do it correctly. So here's an, a nice report in which is described how this is done uh, in Germany. But I think many, uh, uh, many uh, researchers worldwide are using this method now. And here you see uh, the reproduction number uh, over time. Uh, for several months and uh, also the uncertainty is uh, depicted. Uh, it's, a more, it's a bit more complicated to explain what the prediction interval is, which is shown at each uh, point of time. Um, so therefore it's, this is shown in newspapers, but uh, I think many people do not understand what it really means. Uh, of course, people are interested in mitigation strategies and they want to learn from different countries and therefore this survey of trends is really important. Then you see how the different countries uh, compare. And this is a nice visualization which shows uh, in this uh, many uh, plots, uh, the small multiples as it's called in visualization, uh, how the uh, numbers develop over time. Um, I like very much that uh, these small boxes, each uh, one of them represents a state in the US uh, is also organized uh, geographically. So you quickly find uh, the state. So this shows a little bit more information, but um, I think it's still a compromise between uh, a denser coding. You could code the information much denser uh, and readability. So for the general public, I think readability, readability is really important. And then of course uh, the web page becomes uh, larger. You cannot show it anymore on just one page. Uh, yeah, other visualizations uh, and uh, platforms on which you can uh, visualize. So this is uh, the famous one from John, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University. So this, uh, the great coronavirus resource center which provided worldwide support. Um, uh, almost from the first hour on uh, by collecting and providing data to the world. This is a really great, uh, great uh, undertaking. They have added a bit of analytics, uh, which allows the user to explore uh, the data, but still it's a bit restricted what is possible. You know, here you see a chloroplast map. Um, it's restricted. Uh, they are using uh, commercial software, ESRI software, which was really good for them because they had a quick start. They, uh, uh, but then uh, now you feel the restrictions of this software. So they, they cannot, um, uh, they, they have not much freedom. Uh, but still it's, it's very functional. So you can get a lot of information and you also can click uh, interactively on, on, on countries or states for instance, and then you get these in, insets and uh, much more uh, detailed information. And uh, the, the amount of information that is available is really huge you know, uh, without any programming, just clicking uh, on, on the web page. Uh, another uh, undertaking which I really like is uh, the world, our world in data. So they, um, this is an, an initiative from the Oxford University and they uh, collect a lot of data, uh, not just about the coronavirus, but uh, in general global uh, data uh, about public health mainly and provide them uh, free uh, of charge. Yeah, so uh, all data can be uh, completely open access and uh, uh, are licensed under Creative Commons license uh, by you, by Y4. So you can use them, distribute the data, reproduce in any medium and provide this, uh, provided you credit the source and the authors. Uh, you can download uh, all the data uh, I just downloaded it yesterday. It's a tabular data, so 40,007 uh, lines and uh, 41 columns, uh, different uh, um, uh, aspects that uh, they are tracking. They have nicely worked out country profiles uh, and they have 126 predefined types of charts. So which is a huge amount of charts, which are 
predefined and you just click on them and then you get it for your country. So this is a really, really great uh, undertaking. So he, here you see uh, just one example. So the daily new confirmed COVID-19 cases per million people. This per million is really important. I, I, I really hate all these uh, depictions where they don't uh, normalize uh, the data to, uh, to the number of inhabitants. At least if you do comparisons, you really have to, to do that normalization. And uh, now I will just show how you can answer questions by just, just uh, devising uh, uh, right visualizations. <clears throat> using these data at uh, uh, our world in data. So how rapidly have cases increased compared to other countries? Okay, this is a simple uh, plot. So uh, the difficulty is only you have to bridge three orders of magnitude. So you have to use a log scale and you have to smooth the data just by doing a rolling seven day average, for example. And then you get a, a quick overview how the, the different countries uh, um, uh, uh, how it de developed in the different countries. Another question, what is the daily number of confirmed cases over time? Again, you have to normalize uh, per uh, 1 million people. And uh, in this plot here, it's also temporarily aligned. So uh, they start uh, day zero or day one is uh, the day uh, at which uh, um, the uh, cases per million reached one. So uh, there was one case per, per million inhabitants. Uh, this is day one. And this makes it uh, much better uh, to, uh, to compare. Um, and uh, yeah. I wrote, it's also uncertainty in uh, where because uh, it uh, indicates uh, that uh, the underestimation by limited testing is also depicted, namely by color. So the red, lines so they have a very uh, high positive rate in the tests which means they do few tests too few tests and uh, when it becomes very dark so like here or blue then the positive rate is much lower which means they do a lot of testing which means the data are more trustworthy another uh, question you could ask uh, are we bending the curve and again you can uh, yeah do this by uh, depicting uh, uh, the growth rate, uh, steepness of line in, in a logarithmic scale, you directly see the steepness uh, of the line uh, is the growth rate and do it again, you average and again, it's uh, uncertainty aware. Uh, when did countries bend the curve? This is a really interesting uh, question. And for this, uh, people have developed this really nice uh, uh, plot where you uh, plot the, uh, daily confirmed death per million over the total confirmed death per million. You do not really need to, to, uh, to normalize, but if you normalize, I think it's, uh, it's better. And then you see, so very quick uh, countries where China, Japan, uh, Norway, Germany, but then it becomes uh, yeah, the slower uh, United Kingdom, United States, they had no really bent and France and Italy, so they, but they were the first ones and therefore they needed more time to learn. Uh, therefore it's no, uh, no surprise that they were late in bending the curve. And uh, this is also uh, a very, uh, so this signals very nicely the departure from exponential growth. So if you are asking the question, um, are we start, is a second wave coming? Is it starting now or a third wave even? And then you just look at this curve and uh, as soon as it bends down and starts again to, to, uh, to, to come up, uh, then you see that uh, a second wave uh, or third wave uh, will start, which is the case currently also in Germany. And you don't need to compute anything. You just do this plot. You know? Uh, if, you, if you do the math behind, then you see why this is the case, but uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have time to explain that. I, I, I see I have to hurry up. Uh, other questions you could uh, answer, yeah. Age dependency, um, for instance, uh, how is uh, the incidence uh, distributed among age groups? Very nice uh, plots are available. What are the underlying health conditions that lead to higher risk? Things like that. Uh, let me stop uh, here with uh, that uh, chapter. Um, 
by just showing one example, communication of policy decisions. Uh, this is uh, also a very nice de uh, depiction from the Johns Hopkins University. You see a timeline and you see the development of the infected cases and you see the, uh, the when, when policy measures, when mitigation measures have been taken or relaxations have been taken. And then you can correlate this with, with, uh, uh, with the curve. This is really, really interesting. Agent-based modeling. Um, yeah, this is a really uh, interesting topic and many people are doing that now. Uh, I don't have time to show the movie, though you have millions or hundreds of thousands of uh, inhabitants here in, in Germany, for instance, or this is a part of Berlin, and you simulate how they, uh, how they move in time. And then you, you see, uh, like in the simulation before, when uh, people infect other people and how this spreads over time. And this is uh, at a later stage in, in, the, in the simulation. Uh, then of course, uh, many more people, uh, they are already uh, uh, infected. And doing such simulations and doing a lot of statistics, uh, um, uh, then you get uh, real good numbers and you can predict things like uh, how will the reproduction number change if I take certain different non-pharmaceutical interventions like complete closure of daycare, schools, universities, and so on. So you can really calculate in, in percent how this will change uh, the reproduction numbers. Of course, all this depends very much on the quality of the models and the quality of the parameters uh, that are in the models. But um, in principle, uh, this is possible. And if you have uh, enough data, you have a, have a good chance to, to, um, to uh, fit your uh, free parameters to the data and make uh, good predictions. So now let me talk a, a bit about the future. Um, what is the visualization of epidemiological data? Uh, yeah, what is the future of that? I think with regards to the general public and politicians, uh, we have to think more about making cause and effect relationships clear. It's not just about understanding data. This is the focus today, but understanding cause, cause and effect relationships, or even more general about relationships. Understand relationships. Understand relationships between measures and uh, and uh, um, effects. The, the problem here, of course, is the lack of understanding uh, of even elementary mathematical facts and uh, also the, the character of natural laws, which we cannot, uh, which, which we cannot influence. It's just, uh, which we cannot control. Nature, nature happens, it, it just uh, uh, occurs. And this is something surprisingly many people do not understand, even politicians. They think they can negotiate with nature that's that's not possible yeah the same applies to the climate catastrophe yeah and uh, i have no good idea how to to change that situation this is a major problem but we we have to fight against that we have to make clear what natural laws really are and that natural laws are happening and that we cannot influence them you know? we cannot control them uh, yeah another topic i think big topic is um, provide means for answering questions quickly. I showed you uh, a few examples how this can be done and the, uh, uh, this uh, website where these, all these data were provided, they also uh, go steps in that direction, but I think this can be much more, uh, could be much more advanced even. Um, with regards to the experts, uh, what we need are methods to depict and visualize statistical ensemble data, uncertainties, sensitivities, uh, methods to analyze high dimensional parameter spaces, methods to summarize uh, the huge data from the agent based models. And uh, what is also, I think, would be really helpful to the researchers would be integration of our advanced visualization methods into their simulation environments. And uh, a really nice thing is, uh, I think, uh, would is to, to contribute to these open data platforms and help them to, to equip them with a really sophisticated visual tools to make more sophisticated analysis also possible there. Uh, 
just as a short side remark, I think uh, computational modeling of human and social behaviors, which is done in this uh, agent-based modeling is a really great field, uh, interesting field for the future. And um, uh, they need, of course, also uh, a lot of visualization, particularly because this has to be communicated to politics and to the general audience. The model assumptions, the considered scenarios, the forecasts, the uncertainty in the forecast, all of this has to be communicated. And for this, visualization is really, really uh, severely needed. Now, with regards to uh, vaccine development and um, um, uh, track development, of course, molecular visualization is really important. Uh, what is really nice, uh, we see that all our developments of the last decades really pay off. They are used. So that's, that's really uh, something which makes uh, me happy. But we need better support, even more. So better support for structural biology, especially for the analysis of electron microscopic data. So the reconstruction of molecular structures is still a high art. It could be and should be uh, simpler. We need also better support of simulation-based molecular design or track design. This is still not really good supported. So uh, the worlds are too separate still. So the visualization uh, expertise and the molecular expertise is still not really brought uh, together. Some places uh, they are trying it, uh, but uh, I think there's a big chance to improve uh, this uh, significantly. And uh, this is maybe the most important message. I think in the future, we, we should focus on processes not on any more on static visualizations. We should focus on processes, not just animated uh, visualizations. This is also nice for, for, for didactics, but for understanding what is really happening, we have to, uh, we have to use real data from simulations and uh, which simulate processes and visualize this. And another big topic is also to bring all these results from bioinformatics where no space is considered. They consider time, maybe, and, and temporal uh, changes in, in networks, but they don't consider about don't consider the spatial context. Bring this together, uh, of course, together with the molecular dynamic simulation community, uh, and in particular, I think uh, what is really important is to to model and visualize transport processes because this is important for all these uh, biological uh, phenomena. And another topic is uh, there are very uh, advanced molecular dynamic simulation methods available, become more and more available, which allow to simulate much larger systems and also long, longer time periods. Uh, they deliver different uh, output than the current uh, visualization uh, model uh, uh, systems. And we also need visualization techniques to support these. And also machine learning based methods are used uh, to do these. Uh, big simulations nowadays. Let me stop with uh, this uh, nice visualization, which uh, I have stolen from the VCBM image contest. Uh, in fact, I don't know who are the authors, probably one, of, uh, one or two of them are in the audience. Uh, this visualization, it shows a part of the uh, coronavirus, um, uh, which uh, yeah, is on, on, a, on a cell and um, which, yeah, some of them, so there are several viruses. One of them is, is just uh, entering the cell, another is here yeah, open, you can see. And so this is something which I think is uh, very visionary. It shows what is happening, but we have to simulate that and fit it to data and then visualize it, not just animate it. So let me conclude with that. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Hans Christian. Um, a very interesting talk. I enjoyed it very much. And um, we still have a little bit of time for, for questions, which is really nice. Um, and I see the first one here on, uh, on Discord from Helwig Hauser. He asks, uh, when aiming at a proper communication towards the general public, uh, and more importantly, towards politics, are there experiences from this uh, COVID-19 period regarding that work? Uh, so given that uh, some, it's hard to read with all the clapping coming in <laughs> on the chat. So uh, 
he says, given that some hate thinking about a second number, what's the right level of simplification in order to have a best uh, possible impact? <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this is a really um, difficult, difficult topic, I think, because uh, the audience is really very heterogeneous. So um, on the one side, I was really surprised uh, what, how, how big the lack of understanding is uh, in, in, in high political circles. It's really incredible. They have no clue. They don't know what an exponential function is. They, they, they don't know what a nature law is. And communicating with, uh, with these people is really difficult. Yeah, it's, um, I, I wasn't aware of that, that it's so difficult. Uh, I also had uh, my own experiences or participated in undertakings where we had some experiences. So this was really uh, not nice. So the, 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 it's, it's, of course, it's, it's a matter of education. We have to educate people yeah, to, to understand and to make them, uh, uh, to, to, to bring them on a level such we can communicate at all. So this is, uh, I think, the, the biggest uh, problem. And then with regards to the general public, I, I'm more, I, I think uh, what we have nowadays in the, in the newspapers and on the web pages of the newspapers, of the good newspapers, is really good. Of course, I, I don't know whether some studies have been done which really control that. It's my subjective uh, impression. So that it's so simple that I think people understand it. But uh, of course, this should also be checked. So. Um, I'm not an expert in, in uh, visualization for the uh, general audience. Therefore, I'm, I, I don't know uh, whether this has really uh, been checked. Um, but uh, I think we, the only thing we can do is to offer a variety of uh, different uh, yeah, levels on which we communicate and hope that uh, the, uh, the end user finds the right level. No? So uh, it's 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 a widespread, ranging from the pure from the layman to the expert. Uh, it's only possible. It's not possible to cover this with one or two types of visualizations. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding this, I have a question of my own. Uh, while we wait for more questions from the audience, um, so so the um, you, you started uh, the visualization for the general public uh, basically written. Uh, this example map of the infectious cases where we have the chloroplast map uh, that just yes. shows how many people are infected. And since we're also talking a lot, a lot about uncertainty, which is an important aspect here, mm. um, I think I haven't seen many maps uh, that show <laughs> the number of infected cases, uh, also including uh, uncertainty. So do you have any, any idea how this could be done or have you seen uh, examples? Yeah. Okay, there are two problems. So the, the first problem is uh, if we are dealing uh, with, uh, so consider the case of infected people. So there's uh, this dark number, which we don't know. Yeah? Or, or there are estimates uh, how many people are really infected, uh, but uh, these, uh, the uncertainty is huge. And uh, this is the first problem. So we, in many cases, we don't have the data. Uh, for these specific uh, questions, at least. And uh, the other problem is um, uncertainty adds a full dimension of complexity uh, to, to, to everything, uh, also to the visualization and to the understanding. And therefore, I think uh, it's, it's a good uh, advice to not show uncertainties uh, in the elementary visualizations for, for, for the channel audience. Um, for the reproduction number, and uh, I think it's okay, but people just don't take care if they don't understand it. No? Um, but yeah, we have these two problems, uh, the estimating the uncertainty, uncertainty quantification, and uh, then also that it's, uh, it's a bit too complex uh, for many people to really understand the uncertainty. Mm. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have another question from, from Helvig. Um, so, uh, he, he asks uh, whether you have seen good examples uh, of personalized visualization solutions for people that are interested in understanding their own personal risk these days. Uh, no, I, di I didn't see anything, but I also, I didn't search for it. Yeah, but uh, I, no, I don't, don't think that I saw some, some example. 
So it would be really interesting. Of course, I thought also a bit about it. Yeah, what what could be done? Yeah, what could we do to to visualize or make it more understandable? Uh, what what the personal environment uh, uh, um, means for a person and my my behavior um, uh, means to to my surrounding. Uh, but I didn't see anything. Okay, I, I don't see more questions in Discord. I, I would have one last question uh, of my own. Um, so I very much liked the, the very simple, clear visualizations that you showed. So this uh, cases that we all assume, at least, like you said, that can be understood by also by a general public. And um, But my, my question here would be maybe a little bit uh, obvious or provocative here, maybe. Um, do you think this is the right way to, to convey data to the general public? Or do you think it's, it might even be better to use something more, more graphic, something more, I don't know, uh, more expressive, like the, I don't know if you know the, the Charles by, for example, Nigel Holmes that are very elaborate and are not really to the point, but catch the attention of the general public. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um... I think so. Yeah, you are right. Uh, for a certain part of the population, I think this is uh, the best way to, to communicate uh, information. Um, so the, the examples which I showed are from yeah, New York Times, uh, FAZ, uh, and, and so. So these are newspapers which are read typically by academics. And uh, I think for them, it's really appropriate what they are doing. But uh, if you want to... Um, want to communicate to less educated people uh, i think you need even yeah you need such uh, such uh, methods yeah okay um maybe one last quick question before we have to to conclude this session uh michael Siedelmeier asks um how should a parameter space visualization for agent based <laughs> simulations differ from parameter space visualization of other simulations or in other words how can we generalize <laughs> Yeah, okay, uh, thanks, uh, Michael, for that question. Um, in, in fact, of course, parameter space visualization is parameter space visualization. Um, so it's already channel, uh, the term, but what we do uh, often is uh, rather specific. And I think it also has to be specific because uh, the parameters, uh, of course, again, we can generalize and say we have continuous parameters, we have discrete ones, and we have certain ones and uncertain ones and things. This is also general, but uh, there are specifics which, uh, which come from the application. And uh, in order to really provide solutions which uh, the people uh, like to use, I think uh, one has to, uh, to, to, to collaborate with these people, find out what their specific needs are, and then, then build uh, a specific uh, tool, uh, not just solve parameter space visualization in general. This is what I meant. Yeah. Of course, we have to, to develop this uh, really interesting and important topic further, parameter space visualization. But we also have to develop concrete examples for different fields like uh, yeah, epidemiology. OK, um, thank you very much. So as I said, um, this uh, concludes this uh, great, interesting uh, keynote. and. Um, Maybe there will uh, be more questions on Discord channel. So, uh, Christian, if, uh, it would be nice if you could uh, have a look later on and uh, see uh, whether people want to discuss any further. Um, we would now make a, a short break of one or two minutes before we move on to uh, the last session of this conference, the closing and awards. So, thanks again, Christian. And uh, thank yeah. you, too.